Speaking of Calvinists, so uh, one has used his libertarian free will to come on today. Um, um, his name is Jeremiah Nortier. I believe it's pronounced a bit different in his local Arkansas. He can actually tell us the um, butchered way of how Americans would pronounce that French word. But be that as it may, um, yes, he's a Calvinist, but he's also a friend of mine. We actually met after he had a debate with a mutual friend of ours, uh, Joseph Lowell, who's a Latter-day Saint, who runs the LDS Philosophy website. It was on a World's View debate on the Gospel Truth podcast, and it ran for four hours. <laughs> If the Catholics are right about purgatory, everyone who watched it got an indulgence for sitting uh, still for four hours. But it was an excellent debate, and I will actually be um, linking to it. And since then, we've actually been friends. We've actually teamed up together to discuss the Marian dogmas, particularly the Immaculate Conception, because Jeremiah had a debate on that issue. Maybe he wants to tell us about that and the um, interesting aftermath as a result of that. But uh, Jeremiah, um, joking aside, pleasure to have you all. Robert, thank you so much for having me on, and I love how we can be friends, and we can talk about theology, and we can talk about each other's libertarian free will, uh, so thank I'm you for you that. I'm glad you recognize it. <laughs> uh, but I, I really, I've learned a lot from you. Um, like you said, we connected um, through my debate with Joseph Leal, and Joseph challenged me in a lot of ways, especially in terms of philosophy. Um, I have a heart for philosophy and theology, and so I enjoyed getting to talking with him about many of those issues as well. And then with you, I can see your heart and love for exegesis and, you know, more, more of those theological um, mindsets. And so I, I just look at it as the best of both worlds. And so I've really enjoyed getting to know both of y'all. Oh, thanks. I appreciate it. And our theological differences aside, I've appreciated our friendship for the uh, past year, year and a half, I believe. So um, it's always good. Now, Today, we are actually going to be given an introduction to the Reformed Baptist tradition. And Jeremiah is actually himself a Reformed Baptist. Um, so we're going to be asking him some questions and for him to justify his belief in particular doctrines. Uh, there's a couple of reasons for this. Um, most critics who are theists of the Latter-day Saint faith, Mormonism, are actually from a Reformed Calvinistic persuasion. Um, think Rob Bowman, uh, James White, and others. Um, particularly Reformed Baptist, but sometimes pretty conservative Presbyterian as well, like... Um, Turretin fan, who's named after actually my favorite Reformed theologian to read, Francis Turretin. But uh, this, this is not going to be a debate, this is not going to be any gotcha, this is going to be like an introduction to what Reformed Baptists believe, because one, it's going to be an important tool for Latter-day Saints to actually properly understand the Reformed faith. There's been, unfortunately, many caricatures of Calvinism, like damned if you do, damned if you don't, so like um, anti-nominism all the way. I'm sure you've come across that caricature yourself uh, from even Arminians um, on your side of things. Um, but also, I do want to have a series where people of non Latter day Saint faith traditions come on to give an overview of their faith and to give reasons for it. Uh, so it'll be educational for Latter day Saints and non Latter day Saints as well. For instance, I'll be reaching out soon to Christadelphians in Dublin. Uh, the Christadelphians are a restora Unitarian Restorations group I've actually done a lot of work and research on for the last 10, ten years. Uh, particularly their Christology, they don't believe in the personal pre existence of Jesus, something we actually would affirm mutually. Uh, together so uh yeah so this is gonna be like a uh, educational series and i don't think unlike the anglican episode it will run for two and a half hours but we'll see <laughs> so um jeremiah um you're a foreign baptist but before we're going to go into like what that is you know um how about you give an introduction to who you are where you live your family and also the um teen in the back you told me to uh, plug as well yeah yeah um so jeremiah nortier like Robert was saying, we're in the South, so we don't say the Nortier um, flavor of things. So Nortier, because um, we're in Arkansas in the United States. So um, the town I'm in is actually Jonesboro, Arkansas, and I get the pleasure of serving at 12-5 Church. This is actually a new church plant. Uh, and I encourage anybody to get on our church website. If you know anybody, definitely um, tell them about me. Um, tell them about 12-5 Church. Um, my, my heart's desire ultimately is to give all the glory to God and all that I do. And, you know, as a Christian, I primarily follow Jesus Christ, the way that I understand um, how he's revealed himself to us in his word. So that's just a little bit about the place that I serve in 12-5 Church in Jonesboro, Arkansas. And this is actually the first time I've released this graphic about um, a ministry that I'm looking to um, pursue. Uh, so I thought, man, uh, this would be cool to do this with Robert, but it's going to be the apologetic dog. This is an apologetics ministry. And in the culture that I'm in, um, one of the major 
in my opinion, um, false teachings that's out there is called Church of Christ. Um, now, Robert, you've looked into the, the history of Alexander Campbell and that whole movement. It's actually not a new movement um, in terms of the whole spectrum of church history. But my, my area is heavily in, influenced by Church of Christ. And so one of my major areas of emphasis will be contending against how I see works righteousness that are being taught in the Church of Christ movement. And so I want to tell you just a little bit of the idea of where the apologetic dog comes from. Um, and you see this 1 Timothy 6.20. So that verse says this, Robert. O Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. So the idea is that uh, this is a guard dog guarding the deposit that's been entrusted not only to Timothy, but also been handed down um, to saints. And so my idea is that I want to guard the truth. I also want to contend for truth, but it's in this apologetic uh, sphere um, and then another verse, the reason why I really started gravitating to this is talking about avoiding irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. So I hope to get to talk to Joseph Layal again in the future, but I have a heart and desire for epistemology. Um, I believe knowledge is dependent on truth and, and understanding and ascertaining truth is also dependent on one's worldview of epistemology. So I think this verse really shows us how truth is connected to uh, the gospel is connected to truth and how truth is connected to one's epistemology. Epistemology. I think all these can be bundled up and wrapped up in a particular worldview. So those are just a few endeavors, uh, Robert, that I hope to have in the up and coming future. And so I get to tell everybody firstly on your podcast. Oh, that's a world first. And I actually like the beard of the um, dog, you know. Um, ah, you caught on. <laughs> yeah. I, um, for those who don't know, sometimes me and Jeremiah joke that the only thing reformed about me is my beard. Um, he, he's fellow pastor Nathan just kind of uh, got that joke as well just earlier and with respect to the church i'll be linking to that and with respect to joseph lowell um for those who are listening we hope to have him on on the near future to give a critique of reform presuppositionalism so maybe after that we can actually arrange a uh, part two between you and joseph um maybe on a specific topic because as great as the debate w was you had on the gospel truth it covered so much in so little time right but yeah that's uh thanks for the uh, plug um so anything else you want to share about uh, you uh, in terms of your personal life and other issues? Um... Sure. Um, so I serve as a pastor, like mm -hmm. we've been talking about. Um, I've been married at this point up to six years. Um, I have a beautiful bride named Allie Nortier. And she, uh, Robert, she's actually not only my better half, but we've determined she's the better 75% of our relationship. So <laughs> we are in the process of adoption. So we are really excited about what the Lord has in store for us there. I've never been a dad before, so I'm, I'm ready as much as I'll ever be, <laughs> I guess. Um, but apart from that, um, in the world of apologetics, um, I've really been heavily influenced by Dr. James White. So I love his heart and passion for contending for the faith, especially in terms of debate. I, it's funny because people that know me will be like, no, Jeremiah, you like to argue because I would like to consider myself as a very chill, positive person. And through debates, so like hooking up with Marlon on the gospel truth, I, my, my heart and my prayer is to show people how to lovingly engage with theological doctrinal issues. And I believe the verse is Ephesians 4.15 about speaking the truth in love. And so, Robert, when I get a chance to you know, talk to you, LDS, when I get a chance to interact with people of different faiths, um, I want to model that. And so that's my biggest um, encouragement to people is when we see the scriptures that tell us to sanctify the Lord Jesus in our hearts, you must be able to give a defense for the hope that lies within us, but you must always be sanctifying the Lord in your heart, doing this with gentleness and respect. And in a single word, that is with love. And so that's why I'm having a good friendship with you. Man, I'm all for us talking about these. And I'll be the first to tell people, Robert has challenged me more than one time. Um, he, I, I definitely recommend going to his website where he writes really good articles and um, challenging me in my position. And I love that. I look at that as sharpening one another. Um, so yeah, I guess that's just a little bit more information about me and the direction I plan to go down. No, that's perfect. Uh, as I said, I'll be making, a, I'll have a link to your church, um, on the show notes, as well as the link to the debate you had with Joseph Lowell. And also you had another debate with a Catholic, uh, a couple months ago, I think it was in May. I remember I was in Mexico at the time trying to get into the U S on the sinlessness of Mary. Uh, for those who know me, Mariology is like one of my favorite topics. So it was it was good to actually um, hook up with you and actually have something in common theologically for once, you know? Yes, um, Robert. I remember 
I remember when I reached out to you to let you know, hey, I got another debate coming up. And I told you, and you're like, are pigs flying? We actually agree on this issue. And so I read a couple chapters of the book that you wrote, and it was very insightful to some of the exegetical arguments, because with me being sola scriptura, for me, that's going to be my ultimate authority is, you know, what does the Bible say at the end of the day and how can we arbitrate between things and look at context? And so I thought you had some really good, helpful insight in that area. Thanks. I appreciate it. And um, I might be putting up a revised edition in the next few years. I've done a lot of work in the Syrian fodders um, because they're usually the go-to by some. And it's like, no, uh, they did not believe in the Immaculate Conception. So look out for that information uh, in the near future. Okay. So uh, with Ash, we're going to be discussing what is a Reformed Baptist. Um, so I'm sh now I know what a Reformed Baptist is. I'm sure some do, but for those who may not know, uh, what's a Reformed Baptist? You know, why can't you just be a regular Baptist? What's what's so reformed about being a Baptist? I'm sure you're going to get those questions from some people. You know, it's like, um, why, why not just be a regular Baptist? You know, what do you have to reform? So if someone were to ask you, and we'll be going through like some of these specifics as well, like baptism, Lord's Supper, and other issues, what is a reformed Baptist? Yeah, well, that's, that's a great question because where I'm from, there is a lot of quote unquote normal traditional Baptists. A lot of times I put that in the Southern Baptist category. But when we look at our heritage, this goes all the way back to the Protestant Reformation. I tell people initially, if you're not a Roman Catholic, you know, in our, our culture, and our context, then you should be reformed. We are modified and distinct and in some sense still protesting against Rome today. And so reformed in the most broad sense, I tell people, is essentially not to be Catholic. Like we disagree on the gospel as, as Rome understands it. But in a more specific sense, I tell people, being reformed really has to look at the, you have to look at the attributes of God and you have to look at the attributes of man. And I see the reformed umbrella being very specific with understanding who God is and his sovereignty. And then you get into terms like monergism and, and synergism. All these things are very important. Um, so I distance myself a little bit from the Southern Baptist, regular Baptist crowd, because I find myself agreeing with the reformers and even uh, proto reformers beforehand, um, a very particular view of the sovereignty of God. I think that's what sets us apart. Um, but I would be very similar and in line with a lot of the Puritans. And I have a lot of awesome brothers that are Presbyterians. I have more in common with them than I, I see myself having with um, typical Baptists um, that do hold to this libertarian free will that we, we talked about and joked about a little bit. Um, but that's kind of some of the issues. A Reformed Baptist, <clears throat> more on the Baptist side, I believe that a, a, a person should be fully immersed based on their profession of faith. So that's what separates me from the Presbyterians that typically engage with sprinkling. Um, I, I have a lot of um, grace in those issues. Um, I, I think those would be more secondary and tertiary issues. Um, I can still fellowship and get along great you know with the presbyterian that sees the mode of baptism uh, different um but it's those like we were talking about earlier i just recently did a debate with a church of christ and it's funny because i agree the mo with the mode of baptism that they perform which is full immersion based on one's profession but they see this as salvific um they would actually differ with with your stance on baptismal regeneration when you really press them it's really more of a baptism uh baptismal uh justification and that's obviously it causes a, a world of problems as I see it. Um, so it's just interesting because Reformed Baptist carries a great heritage. Um, it's a particular view on the mode of baptism and the Reformed aspect, re the way I explain it to people is really how you understand who God is and who man is. And maybe for those who may just be wondering, so we're not speaking past one another, Reformed in this context doesn't simply mean Reformation, it means Calvinistic, if you will, like the five pines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that's perfect. Okay, so for a Reformed Baptist, of course, like the Bible, and we'll maybe discuss what Sola Scripture is and what it's not momentarily, but of course, like the Bible, the 66 books of the Protestant canon would be your ultimate standard of truth, you know, yeah. because in your view, that would be, at least in terms of the autographs, the sole infallible word of God and so forth. However, what are the other subordinate standards of faith for a Reformed Baptist? Yeah, um, it's, it's interesting because I would point people a lot of, to the early ecumenical councils. Um, I think there's a lot of really good things that have been said throughout church history and kind of the, the two pillars, if you will, that rise to the top is I actually encourage people to look at the Westminster Confession of Faith. And then obviously being Reformed Baptist, 
um, the the sixteen eighty nine Second London Baptist Confession of Faith kind of rises to the top in saying, "Hey, that's really more of where we land." And since sola scriptura is my ultimate conviction, I even tell people, "Hey, even within that, there are things and nuances that perhaps I would see differently and understand." That's why I can kind of import this um, six. Uh, Westminster saying, hey, there's a lot of good things in there. And then obviously there's disagreements. But I think those two confessions in my mind here kind of rise to the top, Robert. Okay. Um, and also, I'm sure, at least historically, the uh, the Synod of Dorsch or Dordrecht, uh, where the five pints were hammered out in 1618, 1619, would be of great importance as well against the remonstrance. Can I, can I make a comment on the Synod of Dor- um Go ahead. real quick? So <clears throat> this is some rich history that I tell people is really important to look into because with the Senate of Dorp, you had this remonstrance, this movement of saying, hey, we disagree with, you know, kind of what was orthodox at the time. And so they had these, these five points, essentially what we know now is Arminianism, right? And so Calvinism kind of began as a defense or as a response to the remonstrance. So you had this counter remonstrance. And what's interesting, what I tell people, because, you know, I'm repping today, Robert, with the, the tulip, right? <clears throat> I tell people the way that this came out of church history was more of a defense. So this didn't have the benefit of having five points presented in a positive fashion. And there's really rich historical reasons for that. And Robert, I think you'll appreciate this. I, told, I tell people if history could have been rewritten, it would have, a better acronym would have been STULIP beginning with the S, with God's sovereignty, because really these five points hang with the proper understanding of who God is. Okay, that's perfect. And you've kind of touched upon some of the distinctives of the Reformed Baptist tradition, like credo as opposed to pedo baptism. What are some of the other distinctives of the Reformed Baptists in comparison to, say, regular, on the, you know, the typical Baptists you might come across on the street, as well as, say, Presbyterians who would hold to the 1646 Westminster Confession of Faith. Yeah, um, and just to go back with kind of the, the major distinctions with Reformed Baptists and regular Baptists is kind of this issue of free will. And, you know, when you look at the, the Westminster and when you look at the 1689, um, we do believe in free will, but it's a different kind of free will. Um, something that I encourage people to look up into the the terminology is compatibilistic free will. Um, This this is a view that sees man's choices as truly choosing things according to your heart's desire. Like you weigh the cost, you want something, and you do it. We would just say this is compatible with God's foreordination and him having purpose in all things in creating this world. Um, The typical Baptist does it in my interaction and there's some people like Leighton Flowers I would encourage people to go listen to Soteriology 101 another critical thinker and I think very highly of uh, but he would have a libertarian free will view of man and so those are some of the distinctives with with Baptist um, Reformed Baptist and Presbyterians there's a couple things that we would understand differently like uh, the view of the covenant that God has with man I would say they're very close but how one u- utilizes the regulative principle I think that's when you press it down. That's why they arrive with um, baptizing babies through sprinkling. As where the Reformed Baptist, you know, just kind of looks at the whole of redemptive history a little bit differently. And we still hold hold to a regulative principle of worship and how we're to understand what's valid in the Old Testament, what carries over into the New. But we would see um, the Old Testament covenant sign having a fulfillment in the New. And so how that kind of carries over is spiritual children. Or, you know, do receive the new covenant sign, but we'd say these are spiritual children of the faith <laughs> that are physically grown and can make a profession and can repent and believe. And so, so those are a little bit of the differences, Robert, with how we would see um, a little bit of distinction with Presbyterians and um, other things like the mode of not only baptism, but the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. Um, I would have a, f- a little bit di- difference um, even with Calvin on that issue. And you'll probably see my Baptist <laughs> coming out of me a little bit more when we start talking about those things. That's perfect. And just because like most, we in the, of course, most Baptists are not King James onlyists, but most King James onlyists tend to be Baptists. You would not belong to any King James only uh, strand. No, 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 no. Um, my, I have a heart for textual criticism and looking at the history of how God has preserved his word. 
Um, but no, I would, I would, I would probably be willing to debate it actually one day because I think it's that important of an issue that our English translations are not the thing that God inspired and preserved, but he spoke um, in time and space and spoke through the prophets. Um, he spoke in these last days through his son, Jesus, and that has a rich history. Um, the Bible is both a divine book and a human historical book. And so we're allowed to look at historical tools to investigate those things. But no, I'm, I'm against King James onlyism. <laughs> and for those who may be wondering, King James onlyism is not the, I prefer the King James or like, I just subjectively think it sounds bad or, you know, they're acceptable positions, even if I think they're errant. King James onlyism is basically the King James, at least the 1611, maybe some other revision is the inerrant word of God. Um, even some may privilege it more than the autography or the autographs functionally. Yep. Um, but yeah, as I said, I just want, just in case some people were thinking like, is he a King James onlyist? No, he's not crazy. <laughs> I think he has a lot of theology wrong, but he's not crazy. <laughs> Thank okay. you. You're welcome. <laughs> but yeah, uh, if any King James onlyist uh, wants to come on to this channel and debate Jeremiah, um, you know, or this would be actually something we could probably actually team together because I think King James onlyism in that kind of strand is like, anti-intellectual anti-critical so but yeah that's going to go into like giving a brief overview of reformed baptist beliefs and of course not all of these are distinctives of reformed baptist uh but for with own, your theological take if you will as a reformed baptist the first of course is one of the favorite topics i'd like to discuss uh but we won't be debating it don't worry the issue of the bible the authority of scripture what is and what is not sola scriptura so yeah i'll let you go ahead so Sola Scriptura is the sole infallible rule of faith and practice in the life of Christian is scripture. And what that boils down is says that the, our ultimate authority in our Christian walk is God's word. And so I tell people over the course of history, God spoke verbally. I believe it's numbers 12 kind of gives us a brief overview that God would speak in these ways with a booming voice. He would speak through um, giving visions. Um, he would, would speak in these ways that, I um, mean, these last days, really, we go back to scripture, the way that Paul told Timothy is theonustos and God breathed. And so I would look to other principles like being noble Bereans. Um, when we hear a philosophy, not that philosophy is bad, but philosophy has to be measured. Any teachings or anything has to ultimately be grounded in scripture. And so that's, that's the heart of a Reformed Baptist is we're trying the teachings that we hear, we're wanting to measure it with the word of God to see if it's true or not. Uh, because Robert, and you know a lot of these things, but just for the benefit of the audience, when we look to, to passages like John 10, 35, Jesus says, scripture cannot be broken. Hebrews chapter six, God makes an oath and he swears by himself because there's no greater authority. And so we're trying to say whatever is, is ultimate, that's the ultimate uh, measuring stick of how we live. And so, you know, something that we're bound by, by creatures created in time is our own interpretation, our own perception of things. So even that has to bend to the will of God's word. Um, so that's, that's what scripture is. And I think Joseph Leal did a good job in our conversation a while back of saying something that script, solo scriptura is not. And he used a good term called solo scriptura. This is not solo scriptura. And I would actually say this is kind of what the Church of Christ actually teach. They'll, they'll say things along the lines of it's just my Bible and me under a tree, no creed but Christ. And I think that is foolish. Um, we can look to other standards that are lower than scripture itself. That's why we're talking about ecumenical councils. We're talking about creeds. Um, we look to pastors. We look to commentaries, teachers. All these things are wonderful in the life of a Christian, but they have to ultimately bend the knee back to scripture. And so the Christian life, it's one-on-one -on -one with God through prayer and spending time in his word, but it's also communal. That's why we gather together on the Lord's day. And it's a, it's a community relationship as well. So it's not this idea that it's just my Bible, me and the Holy Spirit, and that's all I need for the Christian walk. I tell people Jesus has been building his church for 2000 years. That's incredible. I would benefit to read the saints of old and see how the Holy Spirit has blessed them and given them wisdom and their knowledge and understanding of the scripture. And your scriptural justification for like, um, say, solo scripture, of course, would be 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17. And of course, there's text like John 10, 35. Uh, Hebrews 6, and also you alluded to earlier Hebrews 1, 1 to 2, and other texts. Mm. Would that be correct? 
Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, all those texts that basically bolster uh, the scripture, maybe John 17, 17 is another important one I would tell people where Jesus is praying um, to the Father. Father, sanctify them in your truth. And then he says, your word is truth. And going just off the top of the head here, I think it's Psalm 138, verse 2. I mean, he talks about the name of God being preeminent, and he, in the same breath, he also says um, your 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 name and your word, kind of being close there. And so, yeah, no, no, you 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 definitely know our position well. Yeah, and for those who want a letter you seen to overview, you see um, my book and Jesse, not by scripture alone. It's for free on uh, my blog, but I won't be debating you on this. I just want to, uh, to educate people. On this. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, I'm I'm doing my best here. I'm trying to be friendly. I... Thank you. <laughs> okay, so that's what solo scripture is and what's not. It's not a simply me and my bible although to be fair some do have that view but as madison and others have noted uh, and by the way everyone should read keith madison's book the shape of solo scripture it's probably the best single volume work in the modern era on solo scripture uh tradition type zero and tradition type one and two he discusses it's not like a nudist scripture or solo scripture like me and my bible you know under the tree you know praised aloud but it's more like it's it's the ultimate source it's the only thing that's the new style sort of god breed as this proved status but Yes, uh, you know, there's other subordinate standards of faith, you know, uh, like the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith and uh, other creeds and confessions as well, as long as you're, in one's view, infidelity to Scripture. You know, yep. from, yeah, no, yep. that's that's good. Uh, that's a common misconception one often comes across, and I say this as a critic of soul Scripture. So that's kind of a brief overview of, like, uh, Scripture. Um in terms of ecclesiology, and I know you know this, but like for those maybe wondering, that's a fancy term for the theology of the church. What would a Reformed Baptist's understanding of the ecclesiology of both the local church, like 12 mm. church, but also the universal or global church, what would that or day be like? So that's those are the two distinctions that are to be made. So when we do see in uh, Matthew 16 that Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. There's this universal... Uh, church that exists and the way and i think you just alluded to it but this is this is believers um that are are in the fold that are walking with the lord and are saved and so <clears throat> then you have the the church uh, the local church the visible church and our ecclesiology how we pretty much structure the church this is a big difference in how the presbyterians the other reformed crowd would be um you know they have this this hierarchy if you will um, they have this presbytery um, and that's, in my understanding, this is a huge difference with Reformed Baptists. We're pretty much autonomous. Hey, th there's some form of autonomy that I believe in, Robert. <laughs> uh, uh, so we're not really held. You're not far from the kingdom of God. <laughs> oh, uh, uh, we don't have an apparatus above us. We are operating independently. But I will also tell people that we partner with other churches. Perhaps there are conventions that are probably good to be a part of to have some accountability. But in, in terms of our church structures, we just have an eldership and we have deacons. So obviously, we're not Roman Catholic. We don't see any validity when it comes to the pope or the magisterium, cardinals, things like that. Um, and when we'll we look discuss the term, priesthood momentarily as well. So we'll delve more into the priest of all believers soon. Yes. Um, so, I mean, just talking about brief flower reviews, we just see two roles in the church body elders that are and my understanding is elders are also pastors and they are also overseers i think those are just talking about uh, the same office just from different angles and so like i'm an elder but i'm not that old i have a beard but the way i'd look at those those passages are saying that you must be mature spiritually right uh, and, and, not, and just on just as a nerdy aside the uh the term for Hebrew for elder and also beard are actually the same root. So. <laughs> yeah, no, that's good. Um, but um, we're very liturgical at 12.5 Church, meaning that we have an order of worship that we, we see as being biblical, like we have a call to worship. We integrate prayer throughout. We, we sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Um, we're just kind of like, hey, more the merrier. And we see that, um, you know, we don't, we're not strictly like singing the Psalter, right? Singing hymns, but man, why wouldn't we include that? You know, but, uh, but we you actually, not, but you would not the, hold to the uh, exclusive Samity position that some Baptists would hold to. Right. Some other, yeah. And for those who may be wondering, it's the idea like exclusive Samity. I think that's the term. Uh, some groups like the Covenant's Presbyterian Church up in my native Ireland in the North uh, would hold to. It's like you, uh, Christians are only to sing the Psalter and that's it. Right. 
you wouldn't hold to that more extreme liturgical position. Right. And some biblical grounds that I have, I think it's first Corinthians or it's Colossians three and Ephesians five that talks about singing to one another in Psalms, hymns and spiritual songs. And so I just see the, I see it being a little bit broader than that, but I think a lot of that comes down to conviction and I have a lot of respect for people that are wanting to sing the word or solo scriptura. So, I mean, it's, I'm not too far off from saying, Hey, you know, do it. Um, trying to think what else is really important well, well we, just, just on that like uh, that's something we would actually agree with because like if you look, go through the new testament a lot of the creeds like uh, colossians 1 15 to 20 and philippians 2 6 to 11 they're actually poetic and like so is the prologue of mm. john which you know so who, who knows we actually actually agree on something else as well mm. <clears throat> something else that not a lot of baptists do um but we actually have the lord's supper every sunday most traditional Baptists do it quarterly, uh, four times a year, and this has been a long road for me because I, I come out of the Southern Baptist movement, and I will just tell you, Robert, like it's very – it's wonderful gathering together in unity with the body weekly to do these things. The thing you got to guard against, though, is making it mundane and ritualistic. Um, one of the things that guards me from that is reading the warning passage in 1 Corinthians 11 that there is an unworthy manner that Paul is saying, you need to search your heart out for these things. And so, you know, just in short, uh, we do actually take, you know, it could be called the Eucharist or communion, but we do partake in the Lord's Supper weekly. And that's actually foreign where I'm from around here. We're the only church that does that and is Reformed Baptist. Yeah, and we'll be discussing like a Eucharistic theology um, soon because we're actually going into the ordinances now. But anything else you want to offer on the ecclesiology? Um, I think we hit a lot of the high points. Um, I do want to, once again, just reiterate, um, when we talk about autonomy, um, we're not appealing to like a, a bigger apparatus, but something that I'm encouraged to do and other churches is you do want to partner with other ch churches to have that checks and balances. And so members of the church, this is interesting because uh, we don't really have a Robert rules of order um, in terms of, you know, voting and things like that, because the under shepherds they're the ones that have, you know, in a sense, the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Kind of, we look to those passages differently. Um, but a lot of the, when it comes to spiritual matters, we say, look, it's the elders that you should be trusting to guard your souls from. And so a lot of Baptists are congregational ruled. And, you know, I just, I don't see that being the biblical route for us. We are elder ruled. And it's not that we're ruling with an iron fist and are domineering. We're very much in tune with the flock. Uh, but deacons and the, the church are more going to be in, uh, voting for things that are, um, you know, what the building looks like, um, certain events that are coming up, but they don't really have their hands in the spiritual realm, if that makes sense. Sure. And just like two questions on that, and they're not culture, but like uh, just for clarification, when it comes to the Matthew 16 text, as well as parallel in Matthew 18, like uh, you would understand the keys to be like um, more evangelistic. So how I understand that is, um, this is being given to the church, and the, the church's rich history begins with that apostolic um, starting point with the apostles. And so everything, like in terms of me teaching and preaching, I'm going back to the whole counsel of God, um, a lot of it to the, the didactic teachings of the apostles. And so when a church makes a decision, I say a church, when um, an eldership makes a decision, we've, we've consulted the scripture on a matter of church discipline or something, we're saying, ultimately, we're getting this from heaven. We have this confirmation in heaven given to us through his word and the authority given to us to make a pronouncement on church disciplinary issues or a certain teaching issue. So that's kind of, that's how I see the keys being played out. You kind of see it first with Peter, but you see it being used maybe in the new we can talk about exegesis, um, you know, and maybe another time, but just from memory, um, but that also being applied to the apostles at large, and you kind of have them being foundational stones to the church, and so that authority kind of carries to um, elders within a church context. Hey, that's fine. And when it comes to text, like, say, First Timothy 3, 16, I believe, where uh, – 3.15, I should say, where, for instance, the NASB uh, says that the Church uh, of the Living God is the pillar and support of the truth. Would you, uh, would it be correct to say that you would believe, and other Reformed Baptists would believe, that's referring not to the universal church, but more to the local body of believers of the local church? Yeah, I think I think that's how we, we would understand it as being more to the local church. And then when you read that the church is a pillar and buttress of the truth, 
it's kind of going back to the noble Berean mindset is we're upholding the word of God and testing all things to that ultimate standard. But you're right. That's really more of the, the local church there. Okay. And um, it being the pillar and ground of truth or however one wants to render the Greek, you would say that it's more like the local church and the elders and the deacons making sure everyone is uh, faithful to the uh, Bible and its teachings and so forth. Yeah. Um, Robert, you'll appreciate this. I was teaching on that one time to students and youth. And when I said buttress, that's the only thing that they could think about. And then from then on else, it's been saying, sit your buttresses down. I'm like, oh my goodness, they totally missed the point. <laughs> well, you tried, you know. Um, yeah, you tried. <laughs> it, it was predestined not to be, right? <laughs> okay, no, that's no, okay, that's ecclesiology. Uh, now we're going to be going into the ordinances or like sacraments to use a different terminology, but you would use the term ordinance. So let's discuss, and this is like an area of theology I love discussing, as you know yourself. So the issue of baptism. Um, as a Reformed Baptist, of course, you've uh, mentioned this, you would practice pay, uh, not pedo, i.e. infant baptism, but credo or believer's baptism. And you would hold to the view it's not to mean it's not to be done by any other means except immersion. Um, you know. So apart from that, um, maybe maybe some, well, actually, let's kind of go into that. Like if someone were to ask you, like, what's the justification for this as opposed to, say, pedo baptism, how would you respond? And also, could you, discuss like the reformed baptist understanding about the importance the symbolism and the theology of water baptism sure you may have to remind me of some of those points again as we oh, go yeah. through um so <clears throat> i have a lot of respect for the the puritan history and the, the presbyterians i think what's most compelling number one is you, you definitely get clues so there are actually reformed views like in acts 238 some people think that that's a spiritual baptism or if they look to mark 16 16 i don't particularly hold that view I think it's hard, given the clues throughout Acts, that they're coming up out of the water. With John the Baptist, you have the Ethiopian eunuch, um, and perhaps another place or two. But, or in yeah, in Acts chapter ten with Cornelius and the the household, the kind of water's involved. Like that, that's where I tell people um, I want to definitely pinpoint the times in Acts as being water baptisms. Well, I think it's important for a lot of those contexts. Well, let, let you have anomalies know, and you don't uh, have. If you don't mind me just ma making a note of something, just in case someone thinks Jer uh, Jeremiah is uh, making up a position no one holds to, this is actually popular. Uh, James Dunn, who was like a leading New Testament scholar, actually believed the baptism texts in the New Testament were rarely ever water baptism texts. So from, it, it's not it's it's a minority position, but like uh, he's not attacking a straw man. This is actually common. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but like, um, yeah. No, you're right. Um, I remember reading a ton of commentary. Some people in Acts 2.38 were trying to say that this was spiritual. And I was like, nope, I'm not, I'm not buying that. Because um, there's too much continuity as you're reading Acts that they're coming up out of the bab or out of the water. Or Peter's saying, you know, what hinders them from being um, dipped in water, you know, or however he says it. And so I, I think that's important of saying, look, these are water baptism texts as I understand it. But I think where I start distancing myself from Presbyterians, so like when we do talk about Acts 2, 38 and 39, this is one of their verses that say, see, to, to you and all of your children in verse 39, the promise. And so what they kind of do is say, see, you can link verse 39 up to baptism. And I think one of the times that I started studying this the most, I was listening to some debate with Dr. White, uh, maybe Greg Strawbridge, they had a debate on baptism. I think this is where I started understanding this mindset more and more. Um, but Dr. White was, why do you stop at baptism and not continue with the repent? And I thought, oh man, that's key in kind of our position in, in being credo, professing to be a believer. Um, there's there's got to be some level of cognition that allows you to repent and believe the gospel. And so you look at these cases of the Philippian jailer and people, you know, being able to say, what sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they respond in this repentance and faith. And so Presbyterians would say that they believe in credo uh, baptism too for adults, right? But they just have, kind of have this added theology of how they, you know, also extend this to infants. So that's really important in my view, Robert, is you do see a lot of, I would say, explicit passages of professing belief, and you kind of have to make an implicit read between the lines argument, and it's their view of the re the regular principle and perhaps covenant theology, where maybe perhaps there's some good reasons to at least further the discussion there. Yeah, yeah. Okay, no, that's, um, yeah, it's just like uh, Presbyterians and others would point to the household baptisms. Right. And they would claim they probably had infants or young children and the entire household was baptized. 
So right. would it be fair to say you were not believing uh, infantile fate like, like uh, some Peter Baptist like Luther would hold you? Yeah. So um, one text that a lot of people will point to, like, I don't know if Luther pointed this, but my Presbyterian friends, they would say, look at John the Baptist. He had the spirit when he was in his mother's womb and left. And <clears throat> I've always thought that was an interesting text because how I kind of understand that is similar to the prophet Jeremiah and um, perhaps others uh, of God setting. Oh, I don't know. I was going to say Galatians one with the apostle Paul and his call to apostleship, even from the womb. I kind of see that being more of what's in, uh, in mind with John the Baptist is you do have the spirit at work in his life, him being kind of set apart for a particular role um, to be, you know, Elijah, right. Coming in the spirit and power of Elijah. But I don't really see my understanding of the word faith. Pistis is firm trust. And I simply am not able to understand what that would look like on an infant level. Um, if it's there, it's just, it's been hard for me to understand that from the scripture. Um, but this leads into other conversations about like, what does salvation look like or not look like? Because it's the reformers that kind of have a bad name for the, the elect infants, if you will. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I study those things all the time. And I try to help people understand kind of what I think the Bible speaks to infants at that, you know. No, that's fine. Um, so that's the rationale for credo as opposed to pedo baptism. So as a Reformed Baptist, what would your theology of baptism be, positively and negatively? Uh, would you view it as only a symbol? Do you believe it's a commandment that believers should engage in? And I know the answer to this, but would you hold that it's necessary for salvation? And if so, why? And let's give the game away. You don't, so why not? Yeah, um, I'll be honest. <clears throat> So I try to stay away from the term sacraments. Um, now, you know, my Presbyterian brothers, they actually own that term, you know, these things being a means of God's grace. And I know some Lutherans that I respect and I, I see them as being in the fold and saved. But I do tend to lean more on the ordinance side of these being more symbolic rather than any substance of, of mediating grace and things like that. I mean, I'm, I'm real, I'm also, there, I, I have room for saying, sure, are these means of grace um, and whatnot, but I do land more on these being symbolic, but I don't want to adopt a mere um, symbolic view. Like I do think, you know, as I, I see this as um, sanctifying, um, I do see it conforming us more and more into the image of Christ as we walk in obedience. And I think that's me saying what I see that the general Baptist or the Southern Baptist, I think they have this pure memorialistic view of the Lord's Supper and baptism. And I think it's more than that, but I don't go all the way to saying like, this is a sacrament that this is um, there's some type of metaphysic of God with his people that's going on. That's not already there um, with having the indwelling Holy spirit. You know what I mean? Yeah. And just, just when you say like it's sanctifying. So in your view, and I don't impress you too hard on this, um, so in your view, would you believe that the act of baptism, even if, I know you reject baptismal regeneration, but the act of baptism once made to it, it's an aid in one's progress in processional sanctification? Yeah, um, you cut out a little bit on there, but I think I understood your question. So my understanding of like justification, sanctification, um, you got verses like 1 Corinthians 6.11 that show you just how close in my mind justification and sanctification are. Once a person is justified, my position would be by faith alone or apart from works. Um, you are immediately sanctified at that moment. It's almost like this instantaneous miracle, but your whole but life is positional that... sanctification. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Posi positional sanctification. And then we now live in progressive sanctification so yeah, baptism would be a part of that. It's sanctifying when you're being obedient. Um, and I would see when we quench the spirit, it, it, then God will necessarily discipline us, even within this overarching um, umbrella of sanctification. Does that kind of help where I'm coming from? Sorry, I was muted. Uh, yes, no, that, oh. ma that makes perfect sense. No, that's good. Okay. And um, as a Reformed Baptist, uh, to give the game away because you did have a debate on this, um, you would reject the idea that perhaps, uh, the doctrine of baptismal regeneration. So um, what's the rationale for that? You know, because many, yeah. many, many, and I would be one of them, would point to texts where water baptism, like Acts 2, Romans 6, and other passages 
are tied, and you know the arguments yourself, and I'm not going to debate you on this at the moment, maybe in the future, are tied in sure. seemingly to like the means of salvation. For instance, repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins, you know, or Romans 6, where we're united to Christ in baptism. And in verse 7, he uses decay at oh, some translations rendered uh, free, some like Fitz says it refers to salvific justification, and a host of other texts as well. You know them. So, uh, without kind of going into like a water baptism, baptism of regeneration debate, what would the rationale and justification pun kind of intended for the Baptist view would be? It's interesting because I've noticed even in my reform heritage, I take a slightly nuanced, different approach. And when I go back to Luther and some of these guys and even Calvin, you know, being more of the Presbyterian side, they have a lot more room open for the sacraments. And so I think it's interesting because my view is definitely compatible with God monergistically working out all things. And then you got man's perspective. That's how I understand we are to work out our, our salvation with fear and trembling. It's from our perspective. I don't think it negates, you know, God's overarching um, sovereignty at work and things. But I think Robert, what it boils down to for me is understanding how faith and works relate to one another and how they are distinct uh, because I tend to hold a very strong view of works being human energy, human accomplishment. As you get up and you move about, I would hold the position that everything that we do externally are works. And so this is pretty obvious how I see that I see baptism as a work of man. And I do see it as a work of God as well. And so I see faith as being more immaterial. And you heard in maybe my debate, I say it's of the heart. It's eternal. Faith is pistis, to have firm trust or conviction of the truth. So we're talking about different categories. You've got external works of man, the things that we get up and we do. And then you've got faith being internal and of the heart. So you kind of have these two categories. And for me, Robert, um, I look to Romans 4 as a big justification for why I you know, would see baptism as being a work. And then I would look to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8, 9, and 10. Um, being a big part in that discussion, obviously a lot of other texts, but that's, I think when you start boiling down my position, there's a few key definitions that I really tried to develop. It's justification and sanctification, it's faith and works, and then, and then defining what baptism is. Okay. So, okay. And because I promised you, I won't turn this into debate. I am not going to like a uh, debate about uh, Romans 4 and Genesis 15 and Psalm 32. Maybe next time, though, you know, uh, that would be a good discussion. <laughs> so that would be like a Reformed Baptist view on baptism. So let's kind of move on to another uh, in always interesting topic to discuss, and that's the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, mm. you know, however you want to call it. Um, so what would your Reformed Baptist understanding of the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, as some of the Hardy Saints would just call it the sacrament? Um, what would that be? Would you hold to like a, a spiritual presence yeah. view? Would so, you hold to a you think, We're not all. Oh, my bad. My bad. Oh no, go ahead. Because <clears throat> there are different views within the Reformed camp, and it's interesting because I probably would lean more Zwingli, but I, I've heard one scholar put it like this: You got the pure memorialist view uh, that we're just going through the motions. We're going to have a cracker. We're going to have grape juice and we do it about four times a year and that's kind of where the baptists typically land and that's not us but then uh, when i say us 12.5 um, and then you do have calvin's view of more of you know the the presence of christ and, I, and you might can correct me on this but i think calvin had an interesting take where instead of god kind of coming to man really when we're partaking we are going up into the heavenlies it's more of us coming to god and there's actually elements that I really appreciate about what Calvin had to say in terms of God's presence with his people. I think you do get into some philosophy and the metaphysics of how that all works out, and we don't truly know. Um, but I'm not Team Zwingli either in this pur pure memorialist sense, but then there are principles when Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. So here at 12.5, we say there's, there's kind of a middle ground between those views that we hold to. It's not just pure memorialism. Um, but it's sanctifying presence. And we, we kind of joke about that because um, we use these terms a lot. But what we like to say is when we are partaking in communion, there's, there's three things that we want to have in mind. We're, we're thinking back to what Christ has done for us in terms of the gospel and the substitutionary death and things like that. 
And then the other thing is we're looking forward to the marriage of the supper of the lamb. We're about the one day where we get to commune with God for eternity. And this is the part that I think a lot of reformers perhaps miss. Maybe some of this is on, on me and my ignorance, but the present here and now, um, as we are partaking with the rest of the body, we're doing this in unity, in unity with God. And we're doing it in unity with the body that we are currently um, partaking with. And I'm always, I'm always in favor of using wine. Um, we, we do both. It's funny, uh, Robert, we do wine and grape juice. And we just say for conscience sake, it's kind of how we approach um, communion here at 12. And do you think there's any reason why like many Baptists tend to only celebrate the Lord's Supper, like maybe quarterly? Um... <sighs> yeah, I, I have a, I have a guess. I think it's a, a swing of the pendulum. Their reason would say is, well, we don't want to make it ritualistic. Okay. Um, so we don't want to do it every week because we do look at some denominations that we would see as being legalistic. And just to be totally transparent, the Church of Christ almost across the boards do it every every Lord's Day. And I've heard some talk about if they don't do it, they feel like they're going to fall out of God's grace. And it's just this legalistic mindset. And so I think there's a swing of the pendulum with a lot of um, general Baptist, Southern Baptist. And it's arbitrary when you think about it. Um, if you don't hold to the regular principle and you look at the patterns in the New Testament, it's anyone's game. And I'm soft. I, I don't, I'm not over here saying that they're wrong for doing it quarterly. I'm just saying you're missing out on a huge blessing to commune with God in a way that he's prescribed and with the body. You do have some Baptists, you do have some churches that do it monthly. I have obviously more respect as you're getting closer to that regular principle of doing it weekly. I have just kind of more respect. Um, but then even on our side, you got to be careful to really combat against the ritualistic mindset. Okay, no, that's perfect. Thanks, Rod. And um, I'm sure like not just Catholics and Eastern Orthodox may be watching and hopefully are watching this so when it's posted, but even like uh, your friends in the Lutheran group and maybe some Anglicans as well, if you uh, consider uh, the remaining five conservative Anglicans in the world out there, uh, they will actually find to say like the use of is, you know, this is my ah. body in First Corinthians and the synoptics. So would it be fair to say um, you would understand the is to be interpretive, i.e. this means my body, that it's uh, that Jesus is establishing a symbol, but not necessarily a propitiatory sacrifice and so forth um, at the Last Supper. Yeah, no, I mean, really, it's funny because I just think about Luther and you know, his conversation with, with everyone and Zwingli and really, I, um, I, I feel like I've read something that said he was banging his fist on the yeah, table and he yeah. was, uh, for those who are not in the know, October 1st to 4th, 1529, I believe during the Merbrick colloquy, uh, Luther at all like Melanchthon and then Zwingli because Calvin wasn't around, uh, he didn't convert until then they were debating about like, what does ease ease? It's like Bill Clinton, you know, in the mid nineties, you know, um, you know, uh, about what the meaning of is, is. <laughs> uh, I believe, and it's been a while since I said it, like he actually got a pen knife and wrote, this is my body and that, and hoc es corpus meum. And it's like, come on, Zwingli, what part of is don't he know? You know, so uh, yeah. Um, yeah. He, he was very animated about that. Yeah. So I think this conversation does go back to this ancient conversation of what what is intended by is. This is my body. And what I've, what I've tried to point out to people is when Jesus was instituting the Lord's Supper and the New Covenant, I think he was talking in a very, um, a very metaphoric context with the Lord's Supper, and it's pointing to Jesus, right, being the Passover Lamb, as the Apostle Paul would later would say. So that's that's kind of my justification for the is there is in a very metaphorical remembrance context, and other context clues that I'd point throughout the Gospels. This is a little bit more apparent, I think, but like when you go to the parable of the sower, um, you, you see the gospel is the seed, right? And so just show, trying to show that there's warrant for um, this is this is more symbolic. Um, but then I, I tell people I don't want to arrive at a purely memorialistic position. Like I, I do want to give room for saying, you know, God can work in ways that's beyond my limited understanding of these things. How is it that the infinite God and the Holy Spirit can indwell me. I don't know how that works. Um, you know, God is omnipresent in these ways. And so I just say, I don't know. So there's there's a part of me that just says, look, I'm somewhere in the middle of the real presence in the memorial. Um, so, yeah. Okay. And you would understand the term anomnesis, remembrance in Luke and 1 Corinthians to be um, 
not a memorial sacrifice, you know, mm. as some would argue, but it's more like not something like a physiological remembrance, but for lack of a better term, a physiological tool or tool for physiological remembrance of like the atoning sacrifice of Christ, in your view, because it's penal substitution, once for all, debt paid, you know, and so forth. Would that be correct? Right. Oh yeah, no, you you totally got it. Um because, you know, I'm thinking of the the ongoing debate or ongoing you gotta think as a reformed Baptist, I am still reforming and protesting against Rome and that has that goes back to how we understand righteousness and, you know, is this more of imputation or is it infusion? Those are all related things like, like you're talking about. Yeah. Um, and as I said, I'm not going to debate you, so I won't bring up the whole imputation versus infusion debate. So you got off this time. <laughs> uh, but I will note, like, you're debating Peter Williams in the near future, and he is probably the best Catholic apologist. Um, well, one of the best anyway, when it comes to, like, Eucharistic theology. He had a very good debate against Cecil Andrews, and he... Uh, I'm gonna for, have to eat a big slice of humble pie debating with him. You no, know, he, he's a very smart guy, and he's also done excellent work on the uh, pro life uh, in <laughs> England. So, um, but I, yeah, I just thought I mentioned that. Um, I might actually reach out to him to actually get him on the show sometime. But um, okay, so that's uh, Eucharistic theology. Um, we have two other issues before I kind of ask you some questions that often come sure. up. Uh, the next will be atonement and soteriology, and the final one will be the priest of all believers. So when it comes to the Reformed Baptist understanding of the atoning sacrifice of Christ, as well as soteriology, and that's, for those who may not know, the fancy term for theology of salvation, um, let's kind of begin with the theology of salvation first. What's the Reformed Baptist understanding of justification, sanctification, works, pre- and yeah. post-conversion? Yeah, um, this is. I'm really glad you asked that because this is one of those major distinctives with um, uh, how, what separates me from kind of just regular Baptist. You know, um, we kind of start with the Trinity, and this goes to covenant theology. There being kind of three primary covenants. You got the um, the redemptive covenant of God between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in eternity past. We'll talk a little bit. That that's really key. And then you got the covenant of works. Then you got the covenant of grace. And so kind of how salvation is, it's really all of redemptive history is unfolding before our eyes, and it's been determined by God. And when I say God, the triune God, you have God the Father electing and choosing a bride for the Son. The Son is a perfect Savior for that bride, laying his life down for her, and then the Holy Spirit regenerates that bride in space and time and seals her unto the day of redemption. And so... <clears throat> Then when the bride, once again, is the elect of God, those whom God has predestined. And so this, this plays a huge part because I'm already assuming at the outset that God is sovereign, um, that he elects people before, whatever, before they've done good or bad or before they've even lived. God has ordained and orchestrated and is orchestrating um, from beginning to end salvation and redemption as we know it. So where do we go from there? Okay, well, that's uh, – so what's – so how would you define justification? How would you define sanctification? How are they related? How are they different? Oh, okay, good. So with that foundation, with you know God kind of monergistically being at work, mono meaning he, God, one, he is the one accomplishing these things. From the human perspective, um, justification hinges on somebody looking to Jesus Christ in saving faith. We would say that saving faith is repent and believe. It's, it's a repentant faith. Um, but this is also another reform distinctive. We would say the Holy Spirit has to regenerate a person's heart, someone who's dead in sins and trespasses, not seeking after God, going their own way, um, being hostile to God. The Holy Spirit interrupts that person's life and changes their heart with the proclamation of the gospel so this we would say this is an instantaneous miracle but but regeneration always has logical priority and so from the human perspective though when a person hears the gospel is convicted over their sin and sees their need for christ they would repent and believe and look to jesus and saving faith and we would say faith alone apart from their works and so that's how a person is justified by faith apart from anything that they can do this is something that's of the heart looking to Jesus and saving faith, that person is justified. In light of one's justification, he li now lives the entire rest of his life in sanctification. So let me back up a little bit. So back to justification, what took place was a judicial act of God declaring a person uh, no longer guilty of the penalty of sin. 
and has, they're declared righteous. So they've received in exchange Jesus's perfect righteous obedience to the law covering their account. And then all of their sin gets put on Calvary. So this massive um, exchange happens. So like Romans 4, and obviously I would quote Genesis 15, 6, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. My understanding is legazomai. This is a legal, forensic, judicial term describing this, this transaction that happens with, with sinner and God, and it's now simultaneous a sinner and a saint. But all that happens at justification. And then sanctification it's really more relational language. We now live in light of that positional standing that we have with God. And so, you know, we're talking about Calvinism. This kind of gets to the P of TULIP is perseverance of the saints is probably not the best term. I would argue more of a preservation of the saints. This is really more of the Holy Spirit um, carrying us along in spite of ourselves. Um, so it's really a work of God, you know, kind of holding us, not letting us stumble, as Jude says, um, that he, he causes us not to stumble away, so to speak. And we can get into some more of the text that the Calvinists better have some good explaining to do. Um, and then obviously, <clears throat> justification, sanctification, and then glorification is the end goal. Um, and then ultimate sanctification will lead into life after death with God for eternity. And the nature of the atonement, uh, that would be the penal substitutionary model of atonement. Uh, so for those who may not know that forensic model of atonement, uh, what does that entail? Yeah, so when you say penal, we're talking about punishment. Um, we would see God <clears throat> as judge, the righteous judge. And we'd look to Romans, we'd look for, to John 3 about we are incurring God's wrath. We actually stand condemned as, as law breakers. And so... We are earning for ourselves the penalty that's due us one day. Um, we not only have a little bit of glimpse of that punishment here on earth, but we I, I actually hold to um, hell being eternal punishment. And so there, there's a punitive aspect that we are lawbreakers before God being the righteous judge. And so our sin isn't that we've just messed up, but that we are transgress transgressing and breaking God's law. So we need a substitute to step in our place and on our behalf. And so that's when we look to like Isaiah 53, when we look to Colossians, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Um, God is, God the Father is putting all of, of the sin of the elect on Jesus Christ as though he committed all of them and he's taking it in our stead. And so we can get that perfect righteousness of Jesus, the righteousness of God imputed, credited to us when we look to Jesus and saving faith and then all of our sin <clears throat> punitively. The penalty aspect um, is all of God the Father's wrath is being poured out on the Son. Okay, and just for some clarifications, so when it comes to justification, you would not view justification as transformative. It's only, I don't want to use the term only, but for lack of a term, it's a change in one's legal status Correct. before God. Sanctification, processional sanctification is what's um, uh, transformative, if you will. Yes, no, you, you said it well. That's why I kind of push for a hard distinction between justification and sanctification. There's that immediate point of contact when you're justified by faith alone, then you're immediately sanctified. But the transformative is that walk with Christ, walking in the light as he's in the light and the Holy Spirit being involved in us. But yeah, that's a major distinctive of like us and Roman Catholics is where they see the righteousness of Christ being infused over time on your behalf. So kind of seeing justification as being stretched out as well. Okay. And scripture often speaks about the intercessory work of Christ, like Hebrews 7, 8, mm. 1 and 3. He's the minister de liturgios and so forth. Um, and in Romans 8, there's like Christ and the Holy Spirit's interceding. And in First John 2, he's the propitiation to Helasmus for our sins and the sins for the whole world. Now, I'm not bringing up like universal atonement here, but like how would you understand the present work of Christ? Uh, he's like a heavenly uh, intercessor. So in the penal substitutionary model, how would you understand Christ's intercessory work? Yeah, um, I'm glad you alluded to Romans 8, because this is something that I really feel like a lot of Reformed Baptists, or not even Reformed Baptists, but Baptists in general, I'm just like, Jesus is our paraclete, right? You mentioned he's the advocate, but he's the perfect high priest that doesn't fail. He saves to the uttermost, like you read from Hebrews. Um, but Romans 8, I think, really captures a lot of things here. I'd just like to read just a couple of verses. Romans 8, 33 begins, who shall bring a charge um, any charge against God's elect. It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. And this is key. 
Christ Jesus is the one who died, and then argument from the lesser to the greater, more than that, who was <clears throat> raised, who is indeed at the right hand of God, who is indeed is interceding for us. And so I try to explain to people, you know, I, I get, you know, John 3, 16, throw me all the time. It doesn't say he died for the elect. Show me a verse. I'm like, okay, let's go to Romans 8, where he's talking about the elect. And then he says, Christ Jesus is the one who died in the context for his people. Paul is saying us. We understand Romans 8 begins with there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So I would argue the elect is the us that Paul is identifying with. So not only did he die, but he more than that was raised. So his death, his penal substitutionary death was for us. And then more than that, he was raised. So Romans 6 kind of taught how we've been raised in such a way to walk in newness of life with Christ. And then he continues this priestly intercessory work for us. I mean, he indeed intercedes. So what does that look like? <clears throat> I, I, <clears throat> when I look at 1 John chapter 1, I like this type of language um, that he is our advocate. He's coming to bat for us. When we sin, we, we have this accuser, right? We, we would know him as Satan, who is constantly accusing the saints, uh, Revelation uh, 12. And it's almost like Jesus is our defense attorney, right? In this judicial aspect, say, no, he's been covered. Um, so I think in a very real sense, um, when Jesus told Peter, um, Satan wanted to sift you like wheat, but I've prayed for you that he might not do those things. I think that's a good representation of how Jesus continues to intercede for us. But I've told someone recently, the Holy Spirit is very much involved in this as well. In Romans 8, um, even when we don't know how we ought to pray, the Holy Spirit intercedes with groanings too deep for utterance or word. And so I think there's an element to where you do see the paraclete also mentioned for, for Jesus and the Holy Spirit, because both are at work on the believer's behalf. Okay, no, that's good. Um, and the final topic we'll discuss before we're going to go into like some of the common questions. Uh, and I've kind of not discussed like uh, Christology and the Trinity because that would be like an, an entire show on its own. Um, One of these days, Robert. Yeah, would love to. One of these days. But um, so, what is the priesthood of all believers? Yes. So the priesthood. So. You may have to help me on the passage from Exodus. Is it 19? I feel like uh, 1 Peter 2 is quoting from. Yep. The way that I would see the priesthood is Jesus is, is the fulfillment of the old priesthood, but we are made priests in light of Jesus' finished work and him kind of being the, the ark, right, the ultimate high priest. But all this is kind of imagery for believers that we have been radically transformed in light of who jesus is and so we we are partakers we are heirs with him all these are kind of interestingly uh connected to that that we've inherited this kingdom and so we we are high priests in these in these types of sense not that uh, this this doesn't cross over into our ecclesiology how we would see it but these are all language kind of showing our new position our new status as being children of god Okay, that's good. Um, and when it comes to like certain texts in the Old Testament, um, like Isaiah 66, that speak mm. about like God making Levites, uh, would you view that as like, not to be taken at a literal value, but like it's symbolic of the church age and the priesthood of all believers? Yeah, um, I mean, I think those are good questions because I see a lot of continuity between ethnic Israel and I would appeal to Ephesians 2 as the new man, this, this almost new church, because I, I read there is a church, there is a, an assembly um, in the Old Testament, but there is something different. Um, God's people before Jesus' death on the cross, and then God's people in light of that post-cross. Um, so I see a lot of the Old Testament. You know, I don't go full-blown Lutheran or Roman Catholicism with the typology, but I do see a lot of types and shadows um, in the Old Testament, pointing to something that is still yet to come. So even with the priesthood, I think there's a lot of interesting, good context for the Old Testament. I'm actually not 100% sure on the passage you raised in Isaiah 66, but I do think it's maybe Exodus 19 that kind of alludes to God's people and calling them priests and so forth. Um, and I want to acknowledge that, you know, Aaron was a, was a priest um, and you had this particular um, lineage I would see that kind of pointing forward, though, a lot of those unique roles of the, the theocratic Israel as not being the same one-to-one -one for believers who um, live after Jesus' perfect fulfillment of the law, death, burial, resurrection, and his outpouring of the Holy Spirit 
um, those being more spiritual truths for the church today. Okay, no, that's perfect. So we're just, uh, we kind of touched on like some of the uh, distinctives and important beliefs and practices of the Reformed Baptist tradition. So as I've told you in advance, like some of the common uh, arguments, and I will make a note, a number of these are not good arguments, but they keep coming up and being used against uh, Reformed Protestants. If you want good arguments against Calvinism, look at my uh, articles in my blog <laughs> against Calvinism. But um, one, and I will admit, I I uh, shudder whenever True. one uses this because it shows ignorance of the Greek. It's John three sixteen. I'm sure you've heard it before. You know, Dave Hunt and others. You know, it's like it says whosoever. So that shows that there's a libertarian freedom to the person to choose to accept, not just simply reject God. And it also says the world. You know, so you know, you crazy Calvinists. You know, with your five pints. This shows a refutation of total depravity, and also shows um, a rejection of limited atonement and. All you need is one of the petals for the flower to like uh, wither away. So, how would you respond to like? Uh, and I'm sure you've come across John three sixteen being uh, thrown against you as well. So, um, what do you think? That's not a good argument to use. You know, the stress on whosoever and uh, Christ being sent for the whole world. Yeah, no, you're right. I mean, um, we'll say Arminians or Provisionists. They will quote that verse as though we've never thought about John three sixteen, and you're familiar with the Greek there whosoever believes this is literally all the believing ones and so what i almost do immediately is saying look john three sixteen shows particularity we agree whoever believes all the believing ones will be saved that's who's in view there and so usually that's kind of a showstopper for the arminian that's just like john three sixteen. it's like oh man they even believe that there's some particularity going on right there um, you mentioned the word world for cosmos. I just try to talk about there's a syntactic domain of that word, and context is the thing that gets to determine how that word is being used. In John's gospel, we see that Jesus uses world differently. You know, he doesn't pray for the world. He prays for those that the Father has given them um, in John chapter 17. So I, I, tell, I tell them that world, you have to make a case if it's going to be all without exception, which would be their view, or all without distinction, which would be more of the Calvinistic reform view of saying this is talking about types of people, uh, the whole world of humanity, which is Jew and Gentile. And, you know, context, you and I, we understand that context is king ultimately in these things. Exegesis is important. It's just equally ultimate with the context of the passage. And so trying to develop the conversation to saying, look, Jesus is talking with Nicodemus here. And then you get into issues of what it means to be born again conversation of regeneration and so yeah john three sixteen is not a defeater for calvinism um if you don't mind there's another verse that's usually coupled with john three sixteen, and it's first john 2 2 right you're familiar with all the myths that are connected with that right yeah yeah that is the uh, propitiation the elosmos for the uh for our sins but not ours or anybody the entire cosmos for the cosmos yeah so you would understand cosmos there, the us to be regenerate believers at that time, but like the cosmos to be those who will be called out eventually and redeemed. Yeah, um, if I can just briefly what I would Please. tell people. Um, so the fact that John says whole world, I said should automatically think, okay, he is trying to get at something particularly with that. He just doesn't just say world, he says whole world. And in 1 John five nineteen, he uses whole world again. And this is how that verse reads. And we know that we are from God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And so I tell people is whole world is always qualified with the context that is surrounding it. So he is actually making a true dichotomy here. You have the children of God. We know that we are of God. But then he says the whole world, I would say, are talking about unbelievers. They are in the power of the evil one. So whole world is being limited to those who are unbelievers. And so back in 1 John 2, 2, I think verse 1 kind of qualifies what whole world is being used in this particular context. He's talking about Jesus being the paraclete or advocate. And then he goes in, he is the propitiation for our sins, the apostle John is saying, and not only for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And so my position says Jesus is only a high priest, an intercessor or advocate only for um, those who believe in him. And so a little bit of context with the Apostle John, he has a Jewish ministry, right? His, his ministry is for the circumcised when we see Galatians chapter 2. And so here, 
I would just say he's talking to Jewish Christians saying, look, Jesus did not only atone and propitiate um, for our sins only, but even for the Gentile world. We see clues of this in like John chapter 11. We would expect similar terminology where he says Jesus did not only, well, he's talking about Caiaphas, the high priest, who, you know, unbeknownst to what he was saying was this man is going to die not only for um, this particular thing, but for a much larger context, uh, the children of God uh, that are worldwide. And so that's actually really similar to what is said in Revelation 5, 9, which John wrote that as well. Uh, so yeah, just going back to the immediate context, I tell people whole world here always has to be interpreted in light of its immediate context. And John is writing to a Jewish Christian group. And then he is saying, look, he did not only die for us, but also for the, the Gentile world as well. Okay. Um, of believers, yeah. Maybe next time when we talk, we could actually discuss like uh, the present verb and propitiation and what that would mean for penal substitution. But um, maybe next time. So what are the allowable positions for like, you know, there's a number of warning passages that at least on the prima facie reading would indicate true believers could indeed lose their salvation. Now, I don't think anyone would argue there's been like superficial believers. Uh, so we're not talking about that, but like passages where it speaks about those who have been truly justified and called out losing their salvation and like so to limit it to maybe one or two because there's a number what are the allowable interpretations of say hebrews 6 and hebrews 10 yeah yeah and just kind of to set the the foundation a little bit the way that a reformed a reformer would understand these passages is the warning passages are being sent to the church now the church is made up of wheat and tares you have some people that are just merely professors. They're just hanging out. They're going through the motions. They're hypocrites in terms of they're wearing a facade. And then you got the, the regenerate, those who are born again that are justified. And we would understand it, it doesn't work in reverse there. So the warnings are meant to, to scare the living daylights out of us. And the regenerate will respond positively. And then ultimately over time, the, te the tares, the unregenerate will be disobedient to those things. Oh, some allowable interpretations. I'm glad you asked that because the reformers, we we not, we're not all monolithic in how we understand Ephesians six or um, um, Hebrews, Hebrews six and then Hebrews ten. <clears throat> so I hold the view that Hebrews six is talking about when you've been enlightened to such a degree where you understand the depths of the gospel and God's truth in terms of soteriology and whatnot, and you reject it wholeheartedly, like you understand it and you've determined in your heart, don't want that, then. In a sense, I think that person that has been given a lot of light only to trample underfoot the blood of the covenant, it's going to be impossible for them to repent because they've been given so much light. Now, that's one view, and that's really more of how like MacArthur, would under, John MacArthur, that's a big voice. And was, oh, sorry, just for clarification. Uh, some might, you know, just kind of curious as how you would answer this. Some would say, well, that's the case for everyone who's a reprobate, either passively or actively. We're not going to go into the super infralapsar sure. debate. So, like, how is that different? Uh, because it would be impossible for them to truly repent anyway to begin with. Right. Right. Um, a key word in this discussion is compatibilism. So um, they they are blinded anyway. But there is a difference between somebody that lives on uh, in a third world country island of Boingo, Boingo. I mean, they're dead in their sins and their tre trespasses but they've not been given a lot of light. They just had the light of creation. Now, God is sovereign in that, and that's compatible with how we choose. So it's also compatible is those religious um, who have been given a lot of light and are continually to suppress the truth at a deeper level than someone who doesn't have as much knowledge. And so I would just appeal that there are different depths of total depravity, if you will. We're not as sinful as we, as we could be, um, but there's different degrees. And so when we're talking somebody here in, in Hebrew 6, like an apostate, this is somebody that, so I actually believe in that there's different degrees of punishment in hell. That might be a good conversation for another time. Yeah. Um, but I think these false teachers, these apostates that have been given so much knowledge, they are going to be right there next to Satan receiving a stricter and worser punishment than the person who had less light. Okay. No, okay, Dan. Thanks for um, clarifying that. Because I kind of knew like some might just come back and say, you know, well, he's not the case for everyone. So you would say... Every, he, they would still be condemned, but like because God in his mercy has allowed them to hear like the gospel preaching, it's just going to add to their condemnation at the end. So you don't think it's a hypothetical right. yeah. in Hebrews 6? No, um, I don't think, right, because that's more of like an R.C. Sproul understanding as a hypothetical reductio 
at absurdum. And I just, I, I think that there's maybe some merit to that. Um, but I take the other view that these are apostates that have been given. Um, cause I, well, we don't see in that, and this kind of helps me with my position. We don't see terms like regeneration or justification. We see things like they've tasted, they have been partakers in some degree. Now I don't think partaker means the full enchilada, but they've partook like the Pharisees. They partook in witnessing the miracles of Jesus by the Holy Spirit. And they said, oh, you do the works of Beelzebub. Um, they partook of the Holy Spirit, but it was to their condemnation, right? They committed an unforgivable sin. So when somebody has been given the full light of the gospel and they understand it and reject it, that's almost like the modern day parallel of blaspheming the Holy Spirit. And like I said, I'm not super hard on that view. I just think that that's where I land. And when we talk about Hebrews chapter 10, there's different views with that as well. Um, and this may be not the direction that you want to go, but when it talks about um, the one who has been sanctified, um, I, may, I may have to turn there. Do you believe that's um, actually Jesus? I think it was John Owens or John, I think it was John Owens. I, I tend to take that view, but I'm open to the other view that just talks about the apostate that is no longer walking in the faith that was just a said believer. Um, but contextually, I like the argument that the nearest antecedent to the one that um, was sanctified is talking about Jesus and kind of trying to make a parallel to what Jesus said that he consecrated himself in John chapter 17. Um, but I, I'm aware of some of the rebuttals to that. And it's one of those things that I, I just tend to lean that way. But I think there are other reformers that make a different argument for, for that as well. Yeah, and for those who want to see my interaction with uh, John Owen and James White, uh, I have an article Hebrews ten twenty six to twenty nine, John Owen and James White. But uh, so you would, so you would lean, although you're not dogmatic about it, that the one being sanctified is actually Christ, and it's a reference to he's being sanctified as high priest and so forth, like John Owen in these commentary in Hebrews. Yeah, I, I lean that way, um, and I just, I, <clears throat> so I serve a part of an eldership here at twelve five, and me and Nathan don't always hold the same view because, you know, with Sola Scriptura and you're encouraging pe people to be noble Bereans, we, we tell them, look, we're not going to always line up on every view. Now, it must be the same on gospel issues and important issues of ecclesiology and things like that. But these are things that I'm continually, you know, trying to, to think through ultimately. Okay, like uh, maybe like two or three uh, other questions, and then we can actually do a wrap up because um, sure. you've been very patient here. Uh, wow. One would be like, uh, let's kind of discuss the whole soul scripture issue. Um, in, in your view, uh, of course, the Holy Spirit's still operative. You're not like a full blown cessationist like some radical groups like Christadelphians would be. But you would hold that public revelation cease with the death of the last apostle and inscripturation of the final book in the New Testament. Uh, yes. So. I'm sure like some, especially those in a certain community, um, <clears throat> mine would ask, um, <laughs> do you believe that, uh, do you believe that uh, the cessation of public revelation is something that's explicit in the Bible or implicit? You know, I think that's a great question. Um, because when we have explicit, I mean, I think that's a tall order. Like it has to say it verbatim. So I guess, I guess it would be more along the implicit lines and you'd have to build a cumulative case. And this maybe is a good plug to just encourage people to go listen to my interaction with Joseph Leal. Um, it was about maybe two years ago. We got into the sufficiency of scripture kind of coupled with Sola Scriptura. And it did, we did talk about the completion of the canon and how I see that as being relevant with ongoing revelation and so forth. And so uh, what texts do you think would like be implicit in your view that, uh, public revelation would cease around the time of the end of the, um, say the nineties. No, 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 this, this is a good question. So with my, my conversation with Joseph is I put a lot of stock into the apostles and their, um, office and role. And so some texts, um, I'd kind of start holistically and say, you got the, the old Testament that points forward to Messiah We're we're in agreement at this point. And so when Jesus kind of comes onto the scene, He's fulfilling the Old Testament. And the way that Hebrews 1 kind of articulates in these last days when Jesus comes, there's, there's almost a new economy, right? There's continuity and so forth, but he's kind of setting something up brand new. And what we see in the gospel, or we see in the book of Acts, but with the crossover of the gospels, is you have Jesus commissioning his apostles. And he says things in like John's gospel that he will lead you into all truth. This is the implicit nature that I'm getting at. And so Peter was there 
and Peter, you know, kind of being the, 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 the first of the apostles in terms of leadership and that voice, he is the one in Acts 1 saying, look, here's the criteria of how we're going to replace Judas. You got to have been with Jesus in his earthly ministry. You had to be there um, from the beginning and kind of to the end. You know, he kind of gives. And for those who are wondering, rough. that's the uh, Acts 1 and the replacement of Judas with Matthias. Uh, that's the justification for such. Yes. Yeah. So you kind of have these rough qualifications there in order to be an apostle. <clears throat> and so um, you see Peter make, I say Peter, uh, you see God essentially giving a, a slight, um, a slight um, exception to the rule with the apostle Paul coming onto the scene by being an apostle born out of due time. And we'll kind of talk about that here again in a second. But what you see with the apostles and those closely associated with the apostles is they are writing scripture. Second Peter 3 kind of articulates this, that our brother Paul, he writes things that are hard to understand that get twisted like the rest of scripture. And so, and I think it is safe to say kind of implicitly is you see the apostles continuing to be a herald of God um, in terms of giving us what is theonustos, um, God breathed his, his word. Um, and so to give you props, Robert, um, when I was interacting with Joseph Leal, you know, one of mine, and I want to be careful how I do this, especially from this point on, when we see that the Apostle Paul is, is the last of all the apostles, one born out of due time, I don't want to make that like the slam dunk argument of saying, you know, he's the last apostle and then no more revelation after him. I want it to be like an implicit point in this bigger accumulative case, because if we were to just go to that, I don't think you can prove sola scripture from that, or you can prove that that's all revelation stopped with the apostle paul because obviously you got john writing revelation mm -hmm. so i just thought you, you've done a good job of checking me and saying okay you know how does this really shake into the whole conversation okay um really tempted not to turn this into a debate on solo scripture but maybe in the near future we could actually have a full <laughs> debate on that but yeah uh so that so One you would say days. so uh the cessation of public revelation you would say it's a cumulative case but it's implicit there's no explicit text you know yeah okay and just one final question before we're going to wrap up. Um, and I'm sure you've. Oh. Um, I will drop another book plug, something I, I would. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, go ahead. Um, something that I would actually recommend you to read so you and I can have a good uh, conversation about this in the future. I really want to recommend to people um, a book called The Canon of Scripture, a Kruger. presuppositional study by Philip Kaiser. Oh. He makes a few incredible arguments he actually tries to make more of an explicit case for scripture only being at the hands of prophets this is where i'm willing to critique my view a little bit um and the apostles functioned as pro prophets when they gave a scripture along with like luke jude james they in those moments of giving scripture were functioning as a prophet really compelling case and so i'll give you a big a big point that i'm studying through this book i've read it once already and already started reading back through and i really like some of the points he makes the case that daniel 9 when you got kind of the short list right before you get the destruction of the temple is you will have sealed up vision and prophet and then he tries to make the case that the culmination of those 70 weeks of daniel happened with the destruction of the temple so his point is there's no more vision there's no more prophet after the destruction of the temple so something else that has to be contended for is that the book of revelation would have had to be written before 70 a.d he has arguments for those things but that's there are those out there that make the explicit case that there is no more vision or prophet or revelation after 70 a.d i just ordered the book on amazon so i'll let you know when it Ooh. arrives it's a 400 page book but me a 400 page book is fine so we can discuss it maybe later but thanks for the yeah, recommendation absolutely and just one other question that usually comes up is like well in your view god uh, whether you're infra or super lapsarian god has actively elected people um infallibly uh, and that won't change it's um it's unconditional and it won't change and whether he actively or passively did so and that's a super infra lapsarian debate we won't go into that because it's like the filioquic clause it's super esoteric there's a reprobate people, and yeah. no matter what, the reprobate will ne uh, will never be able to repent truly. They may feign religiosity, but they're not true believers, so forth. You know. So why, um, I'm guessing in your view, you would agree with most reforms that the call to repent and believe the gospel is for everyone without distinction. Would that be correct? Yep. 
So, right. um, and some, myself included, would say that they're, 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 that's a um, contradiction. You know, uh, God is basically commanding the impossible. So, what would you respond? How would you respond to someone who would say, "Well, isn't there actually um, a problem or a uh, an issue with God calling everyone to repentance um, without distinction?" But since the eternal past, he and he's known this infallibly. He's also actively elected the elect. Uh, will only grant to the elect at the um, a time he's uh, foreordained to irresistibly call them and so, and to redeem them and so forth. So, can you see the dichotomy and how would you respond to that issue? Sure. Uh, I, well, I think it's a great question. Um, and these are things where I have to really think about certain passages that would make me go down this line. Um, the reason why it makes sense conceptually is I think there's a passage in 2 Corinthians that talks about the gospel essentially being a sweet-smelling aroma for those who are being saved, and then it's like smoke in the nostril of those that hate God. And so what I see the, the gospel as being is like a magnet, and it's drawing those, we would say the elect, for those that, that God is working in, that are convicted over sin, and it's repelling those that want nothing to do with God. So when you look at prophets in the Old Testament, um, some people's ministry, I think it was the prophet um, of Isaiah or perhaps Jeremiah. So that's God's uh, prerogative. The majority of his ministry the heralding was one of the of gospel judgment, to repent and believe condemnation and for Jesus people that um, for a lot of ministers, repent. people reject that. Um, I would say that's, that's one means in which God uses for um, him working out his plan of redemption. There are those that will only reject it. I think what keeps me sane is knowing that I do not know who is going to respond positively to the gospel or continues to reject it throughout their life or who fake it and all those things. I leave those things up to God, but I'm just called to be faithful, to call all men everywhere to repent like Acts chapter 17. Um, but it kind of gets down to the, the unregenerate and their hostility and hatred for God will only reject it. Now that rejection may happen in religiosity or paganism or hedonism, whatever. Um, but then the, the regenerate, those that God has foreordained, that God, you know, is working in their life, this will be that sweet smelling aroma when they finally hear the good news. And so I think that's how I view it is that's one of the means in which God has determined to um, um, store up wrath for the day of wrath for those that reject it wholeheartedly. Now, a big part in this is compatibilism. I think it's compatible for God to determine a world and everything that's going to happen within it to have purpose. That's the whole cake. Like I tell people, if, the, if they're going to hold to a high view of God's sovereignty, it has to be determinism. God has all knowledge, of, and not like Molinism, of all possible events. No, but he has exhaustive knowledge of what is going to be. Now, that also would include our genuine, not libertarian actions, but our genuine feelings of choice of wanting to do something. Um, I see those being compatible together. People will simply reject it, those that God has purposes in, and it's, it's compatible because they feel that vitriol, that, that hatred and rejection, that they will be held accountable to the light that has been given to them. So um, I, we can go a few different directions with this, but I want to give you a chance to chime in. Um, wait, I don't want to take too long. Um, we, we could spend like hours in each question, but <laughs> would, you, would you agree, though, that God is commanding for the reprobation? Um, and I'm guessing you're infralapsarian, but correct me on that. You know, so he passed the V, passed away. Um, <laughs> Regardless, uh, he's commanding the impossible when it comes to the reprobation. Um, in some senses, like I understand where, where the question is coming from. Um, when he's commanding the impossible, it's interesting to phrase it like that because they are being commanded to do something that their nature detests and rebels against. So this is where we, the only way I could you know, say yes to it is in this compatibilistic sense. Um, God is foreordained for his purposes, and yet – you know, in a very natural sense within time and space that the choice to choose A or B is there, but they will always, according to their nature, choose B, a, a, a choice of rejection. And they ascertained, you know, the possibility of choosing A, but why in the world would I bend the knee to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior? I'm totally fine with living life how I want. I don't want to give up. Um, so it depends what you mean, the impossible. Yeah, on one, one hand, God has purpose in all things that he has predetermined before the foundation of the world. But I try to encourage people, that plan of redemption that's unfolding is very much real. And their rejection of that, from God's perspective, couldn't be any other way. But their choices are legit in the matter of choosing their rejection. So I don't want to sound like you know, a politician that doesn't answer the question. 
Um, but God, I wouldn't, I would say <clears throat> the gospel is meant to go out to the reprobate, but God has a purpose in their rejection of it. So feel free to press me more on that because I don't want to seem like I'm not answering the question. No, no, I get you. Like this is important to be told the and compatibilist freedom when it comes to the whole debate. Um, I would reject both, but how I would view it in uh, it, it would be more nuanced, right. but just to give a brief overview, it's like when it comes to rejecting the gospel, that's the case for the elect until they're irresistibly called. Right. You know, there is the belief in reformed theology that just uh, an elect person is totally depraved until they're regenerated and irresistibly called. So they'll naturally reject the teens of God. They'll reject the gospel message. They can even yeah. resist the Holy Spirit when it's not right. um, salvifically calling them or dragging them, if you will. So. Right. The view would be, um, and again, it would be a bit more nuanced, but just give me um, a little less nuanced position just for time. Uh, God predestined whether actively the elect, the uh, election of his people, the elect, and the elect only. Oh. And he'll only grant the elect only the gift of repentance. It's something God has to grant first. You would agree. So yeah. when he's calling someone, he has either actively or passively. I'm not going to, again, not going to go into the whole esoteric infra sure. uh, superlapsar in debate. That'd be fun, but maybe just me, you, and someone else who has read Baxter will actually know what's going on here. Um, even if he's passive in it, and maybe I should ask without going into too much detail, do you believe in uh, passive reprobation? Yeah, so okay. um, go real quick, just as kind of a qualifier, when we talk about infralapsarianism, supra, and all these things, I actually have a problem with all of them to some degree or another because of our creatureliness within time and space it's really hard for me to get into the mind of god and trying to figure out which has logical priority mm -hmm. one one illustration that i heard that i really liked is like when you bake a cake at the very beginning you have the bowl and you have these ingredients it doesn't matter which ingredient you put in first in order to start making the cake and so when we start talking about did god have in mind the elect first or the reprobate and how that all pans out i'm not sure but this is how I've told people, and I think this has really helped people understand my perspective. So Ephesians 1, I would see the Trinity there. And then you get a clue there in verse 3 and 4 about before the foundation of the world. And so verse 11 talks about the counsel of God. And so what I tell people is this is a Trinitarian council. God, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, um, in some type of way that we can only know analogously, like our human language doesn't begin to actually represent what's going on. But you have the Trinity counseling about which logically possible world to actualize and create. Now, I'm saying time and space and everything that comes about from that and how redemptive history is going to pan out to the praise of his glorious grace. So, you know, something I would caution people against is, you know, I would want to stay away from what's called equal ultimacy. How God chose the elect would include his extension of grace and mercy of how he's going to bring about those attributes um, in drawing the elect. It does look differently. It's, it's um, asymmetrical in terms of how God has set up and ordained the reprobate. And I do think there is passive involved. Now, it's all mapped out before the foundation of the world. But in terms of secondary causes of how God brings that about, he uses different secondary means to bring about his purposes for the reprobate than how he effectually is um, at play and at work in the lives of those that he's lavishing his love, his grace, his, his mercy upon. Does that make sense? So I want to say there is a council of God where they determine it. But as it plays out in real time, there's a radical distinction of how God relates to both. Yeah, um, although unless there's one that's actually studied Reformed theology, there's a lot of inside baseball at the moment. Um, yeah. And being and being the rare Latter-day Saint who's read Calvin and Francis Church. And, um, sure. <laughs> but uh, so we can move on, but like uh, just to give my uh, two cents, uh, anyone sure. who wants to look up my article, a uh, theological a critique of the theological presuppositions underlying Reformed theology. It's a response to another Reformed Baptist in the UK. Um, we're not going to go into this, but uh, okay. Well, uh, we've actually been at it for a while now. I do appreciate your time. Uh, before uh, we end things, um, uh, any books or uh, if someone wanted like to say, I, I'm kind of curious about this Reformed theology. I'm curious more specifically about this Reformed Baptist tradition. If you could recommend any books or articles, I'll be linking, of course, to the 16, uh, 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith in the uh, show notes. But if there's any books, 
articles, resources. One that I would recommend would be the tree volume uh, Creeds of Christendom by Philip Schaff if you want to go into, like, say, mm. the Council of Dort and its um, decrees. But any uh, modern works you would recommend on various topics we discussed today? Yeah, and a little bit of this will bleed over to other authors that have in, in impacted my life in terms of how I've ended up where I am today. I would definitely say Dr. James White has been one of the most influential writers, speakers, debaters in my life. So um, I hope you get to debate on various issues. I just, I would, I would pay to see that. <laughs> but um, the Potter's Freedom, even though he wrote that in response to Norman, was it Norman Geisler's Chosen But Free? Yeah, Geisler's Chosen But Free. I have the second edition of both books. Uh, I say this as someone who's a critic of Reformed theology. Geisler's book is dreadful. <laughs> um. The Potter's Freedom is really good because it really deals with the objections and issues, but not only engages with that, but then presents kind of this reformed tradition in a positive light. Um, so I definitely recommend the Potter's Freedom and then in understanding reform soteriology and how justification is so important in that in the book of Romans, um, especially in opposition to Roman Catholicism. Um, I also recommend Dr. White's book, The God Who Justifies. Um, so those have been really good books, and this is not a Reformed Baptist uh, recommendation, but uh, R.C. Sproul, I've really appreciated a lot of his insights into just, you know, understanding the sovereignty of God. So he wrote Chosen by God and the Holiness of God. Those were two really good books. Um, A.W. Pink wrote The Sovereignty of God and the Attributes of God that I highly recommend to people because th I, like, remember earlier when I said Stulip? The S is really foundational for everything else working properly. So you got to have the right view of God in order to have the right view of man. And so the attributes of God, it's just, it's just up there in terms of you got to understand what a saity is, what God's omniscience looks like, a lot of his immutable attributes, his incommunicable attributes, if you will. Um, so there's a, lot of, there's a lot of those types of books that I would just say, um, man, uh, maybe we can link some more in the description. But yeah, you've obviously the second uh the london baptist 1689 um, that's going to be kind of a overarching view of kind of what the reform heritage looks like okay that's wonderful and before we end uh, if someone wanted to reach out to you uh, what would be the best way to uh get in contact and see your previous uh videos debates and works yes hey i thought of one more book Go that ahead. you might appreciate this plug so because you gotta think I'm Reformed Calvinist, um, and the reason why we say Reformed Calvinist is because um, Reformed theology does, is not Calvinist. There's distinctions, but they're definitely related. Uh, so anyway, um, but I'm Trinitarian to the core, and as maybe we can talk about at another time, especially with Joseph Leal, but I'm also um, presuppositional in my methodology and apologetics in terms of contending for the faith. So there's a book out there by B.A. Bosterman, Brant Bosterman, on the Trinity, the Vindication of Christian Paradox, a refinement of Cornelius Van Til. Um, I would highly that, that this book is up there in terms of you know nuance, and I had to have a dictionary almost every page, but it paid off in terms of really understanding the arguments that he's putting forth. Um, so I just wanted to recommend that book just real quick in passing. And, and just on uh, presuppositional apologetics, um, we'll have Joseph Lowell on in the near future to give a critique of it. But one of the best books on presuppositional apologetics is um, Van Til's Apologetic by the late Greg Bonson. Uh, so it's it's like a biblical commentary where you have the biblical text and then you have the exegesis. Right. You have Cornelius Van Til's writings and he's like the granddaddy of modern precept apologetics. And then you have Greg Bonson, who's probably the best precept debater there was uh, he passed away in 94 after complications of heart surgery but um it's it's a hefty tome but um it, it was the first book i read on precept apologetics and um it's much better than the lack of a term the bastardized form you get on the internet and uh, web circles it's the actual um bonsian fantillion uh, precept yeah. not the watered down stuff you come across yeah but yeah i totally recommend yeah. that yeah so <clears throat> if you want to look up some of my content obviously i'll be promoting the apologetic dog in the near future so be on the lookout for that but you can look up my name on youtube jeremiah nortier and i'm just keeping kind of a running archive of some of my sermons my, my debates um, and a lot of my debates will have a link over to marlin's channel at the gospel truth and then um, robert will post a link to 12.5 church where we keep a lot of our stuff um, but yeah, uh, just be on the lookout for the apologetic dog and anybody can reach out to me on Facebook. 
um, send me, that's kind of how me and Robert um, started connecting with each other is he was asking me really hard questions in my debate against uh, Joseph Leal about two years ago. And eventually that overflowed into email. So I'm definitely for email, but if you, if you want some of those things, just reach out to me on Facebook messenger. I'd love to be your friend and us continue to have good dialogue and discuss the, the scriptures together. Well, Jeremiah, um, I do greatly appreciate your time. Hopefully this has been educational for those who uh, will watch this video. Hopefully Latter-day Saints and others who are not uh, Calvinists and even themselves who are critical of reform theology will actually have a better grasp of what you believe and also more importantly, why you believe it. So like interactions will be much more fruitful and we won't be speaking past one another. And again, I do greatly appreciate your time. It's, um, and hopefully we can have you on again in the near future. So uh, with that, um, again, greatly appreciate your time. And until uh, next time, um, take care and God bless.